Hello. No, it's not Frank. This is Leia from LeiaForSci.com, and today I'm hijacking Frank's channel to help you solve problem of the day number seven. You can find many more problems of the day by checking his Instagram, OrgoMadeEasy, or visiting the link in the description. In this problem, we're given a starting molecule and an overwhelming number of reagents. Now, I don't know if your professor is going to give you this many steps, but if you are confident approaching this style question, then you can tackle anything, no matter how long or short it is. I'm going to show you two ways to solve this. The first is the long step-by-step -step breakdown, and this is how you should be studying. But once you get it, I'll show you the exam style shortcut so that you're not wasting time or writing out millions and millions of steps. Let's start by analyzing the starting molecule. We have a carbon chain that is going to undergo a whole lot, so let's number it. Let's see exactly what we have where. We have a six carbon chain, triple bond between three and four, and methyl groups on two and five. The first reagent is H2 with a Lindlar's catalyst. Anytime you see hydrogen, you should recognize hydrogen likes to break double bonds. But with a Lindlar's catalyst, we're looking at a poison metal catalyst. It slows it down. It doesn't give us a complete reaction. So we only break one of the two pi bonds for an alkene product. But more specifically, Lindlar is metal. Metal grabs pi bonds from the same face, adds hydrogens to the same face, and so we're going to get a cis product. I like to start the product with the pi bond to make sure that it winds up cis, and that means we're looking at carbons 3 and 4 with a pi bond, and let's add everything else back in. This is why it helps the number so you see exactly what's where. Carbons 2 and 5 are like isopropyl groups or simply have two methyls coming out of them. Your product doesn't have to look pretty, it just has to look correct. For step 2, we're told to react with Cl2 and H2O. Cl2 is a dihalide, and that means it will be a halogenation reaction. The problem is, when a dihalide is dissolved in a polar protic solvent in something like water or alcohol, the solvent is going to interfere with the reaction. So instead of adding two halogens on neighboring carbons in an anti-configuration, we're going to add just one halogen, and the second position will get attacked by a water which is then deprotonated to give us an OH group. This gives us a halohydrin where the alcohol prefers the more substituted carbon. However, if you look at it, both of these carbons are secondary and so it doesn't matter where you put your chlorine, where you put your OH, as long as one comes out of the page and one goes into the page because it's an anti-addition. Step three is tricky. We're reacting with NaH which at first glance does not appear to do much, so you have to break it down. What is NaH? What about this looks reactive? Anytime you see Na+, recognize that it's a positive spectator. Cross it out. It does nothing except balance the negative charge of the hydride, which in this case is the reactive molecule. The negative hydride is looking for something positive or partially positive to attack. And that means if we look at the polar bond between O and H, where H is partially positive and O is partially negative, hydride will grab that partially positive hydrogen, giving oxygen back the electrons and bubbling out of solution as an H2 gas. This makes the reaction irreversible because the gas is gone and you have nothing to put back onto the oxygen. But what about the molecule itself? Does it remain as just an O- on the molecule? Not quite. Don't forget that when you have a negative oxygen, in the presence of a molecule with a good leaving group like chlorine, you can have an internal SN2 reaction. In this case, oxygen will go from behind, attack the neighboring carbon, and kick out chlorine. The oxygen never broke away from the carbon on the left, so it's still attached, but it also attacked the carbon on the right. So now oxygen is bound to both the carbon on the right and the carbon on the left, giving us an epoxide. What happens when you react an epoxide with a phenyl Grignard? First of all, keep in mind this will be a slow reaction because phenyl is a benzene ring. It's big and bulky. And here we have a lot of bulk as well. Taking that into account, the molecule is symmetrical, so the phenyl can attack from either side. We'll show the bond between phenyl and magnesium reaching out to attack either carbon holding the oxygen and breaking that bond by kicking the electrons back up onto oxygen. 
For the oxygen bond that was not broken, it still attached on dashes to the carbon. If your initial problem put OH coming forward, it would be on a wedge, same thing. I'm simply working with dashes. The Grignard attacked opposite the oxygen, and so if oxygen was going into the page, the phenyl or benzene ring is now sitting on a wedge coming out of the page. But we don't want to leave an O- by itself because that's reactive. And so in the next step, we react with H3O+. This is an acid workup, which simply gives the OH- something to grab so that we can protonate that negative oxygen. Now that we have a neutral oxygen, Let's go ahead and react it with CrO3, H2O, and H2SO4, which you should recognize as a combination of reagents that will react to form H2CrO4. Overwhelmed? Take a step back. Lots of oxygen, lots of oxygen, lots of oxygen. How about an oxidation reaction? What can we oxidize on this molecule? Oxygen. It's a secondary alcohol. That means if we take the hydrogen on carbon and on oxygen away so that we can form a pi bond between carbon and oxygen, we're going to get a ketone. The ketone is an oxygen bound to an sp2 hybridized carbon, and that means it's not into or out of the page, it's trigonal planar, it's flat in the plane of the page. In the final step, we're given three different reagents, but two options for our carbon compound, so let's take a look. The first two are PPH3 and NAH, and the carbon compound, which is either ethyl bromide, two carbons attached to bromine, or a longer carbon chain with a ketone product. So you see something like this, you're given either of the two carbon chains. The first clue that should come to mind, PPH3, that should be a Wittig reaction. In a Wittig reaction, you're looking for a carbonyl to react with an R group bound to PPH3, and then all you do is redraw the molecule exactly as you see it, including the pi bond, but instead of an oxygen, you take that R group and plop it on its head. And there's our R group. So how does this apply if there's no R group attached to the PPH3? This is a side reaction that you have to recognize where you take the leaving group on carbon do a separate series of steps, and this is why we have all these reagents, and create that R bound to PPH3. So we would rewrite this as ethyl PPH3, and this one will give us our carbonyl, and then at the end we have a PPH3. We're still reacting with this initial molecule. Here's the carbonyl that we want to break, so what do we plop on its head? An ethyl group or this molecule. And the reason you are given two different products to consider is because some professors will want you to recognize the difference between an E and Z product, whether or not you have resonance. And Frank discusses this more in his Wittig video, so if this is something you're required to know, make sure you go back and study that video, also linked below. So what do we get for our final products? For the one on the left, we'll have that same molecule, but instead of an oxygen, we take that ethyl group and plop it on its head. There's carbon one and carbon two of the ethyl. For the longer group, the one that has a carbonyl and resonance stabilized, we start the same way. We have the pi bond, but this time we're just going to twist the product. And if you get stuck here, just number it. We attach at one, two has a carbonyl, and three. That's one, two, and three, where two has a carbonyl. At this point, I want you to take a deep breath I know this was long and complex, but I want you to think about it step by step. When you see a big problem like this and you're instantly trying to react the final step with a starting molecule, yes, that's overwhelming. But instead, if you look at it one step at a time, what do I do in the next step? What do I do in the next step? You will slowly and carefully reach your final product. Once you're comfortable doing it the long way, let's see the quick way that you can accomplish this on your final exam without having to write it out so many times again and again. Before we start the shortcut, I want to point out that I have many organic chemistry cheat sheets, practice quizzes, and so much more on my website, layerforsci.com slash easy or checking the link in the description. Are you ready to do this the fast way? Your goal on the exam is to rewrite the molecule as few times as possible by marking up the original molecule or redrawing a version that you can mark up. So let me show you. 
We're starting with an alkyne. Step one, H2 and Lindlar, we need a cis alkene, so we'll break a pi bond, and I'll just show an arrow to remind myself that these two groups are facing down. In the next step, we're reacting with Cl2 and H2O. One goes forward, one goes back, so I'll just add them exactly where I see them. Cl and OH. Again, this is where you're already confident with the products, you don't have to work out the mechanism or the step-by-step. -step. In the next step, I see NaH, and I know it's going to do a deprotonation of the oxygen, and then an internal SN2 attack for an epoxide formation. So I will draw a bond there and cross out the Cl, recognizing that the stereochemistry will be the same as the initial oxygen, because the epoxide is either bound with two bonds going into the page or two going out of the page. At this point, because it's starting to get overwhelming, you can rewrite what you have at this time. So what we have is this molecule. The arrows remind me to put these two groups down. The chlorine is crossed out. The hydrogen is crossed out. All I see are oxygen bonds going into the page. What do I do now? I have a Grignard attacking, and a Grignard is always going to be followed by something like H3O plus to protonate. So we'll break a bond, put a hydrogen there for the protonation, and put the incoming Grignard, in this case the phenyl, to the carbon that was attacked. We then have an oxidation step, so we cross out the hydrogen and add a pi bond. And finally we have the Wittig step, which at this point I would rewrite it again, only because it's starting to get messy. One more time. Here's our skeleton, we have a phenyl group, and we have a carbonyl. So let's see what we get for the Grignard. If your exam had the bromine on an ethyl group, then simply cut the oxygen and put an ethyl. If you had this group, then you would again cut the oxygen and put one, two, three, one, two, three with a carbonyl. Very little writing, very little rewriting, and now that we have a nice product, we find where the professor wants it for the solutions. We rewrite it very pretty, make sure everything is there, and your final step, always, always, always remember to count your carbons. It's very easy to gain or lose carbons along the way, so you want to make sure that with all this hard work, you don't lose points for something as silly as dropping a carbon. How many carbons do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Product, one, two, three, four, five, six. A methyl group on five and two. And since we're showing this product, we have one, two, three, and that right there is one, two, three. We are good to go. If you found this video helpful, leave a comment below letting us know if you want more of this style video. Don't forget you can find the other problems of the day on Frank's Instagram or go made easy and of course my practice quizzes and cheat sheets layerforsci.com slash or go made easy.